Now I want to talk about the Palestinian Infathada. What is it? Well, it's an uprising, uprising against the nation of Israel. For those of you who don't know, Israel and the Palestinians have been in countless talks, peace talks that have fallen apart over a number of years. And of course, this is part of and parcel for Bible prophecy, as the Lord tells us and reveals to us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, that when they shall call for peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman travail upon a child. So we know that the birth pangs of the failed peace process are already here. We know that the Palestinian charter calls for the destruction of Israel. They've been working for it. Now the first infanthata, as you can see up on the screen there that I put up for you, started in December 1987 and it lasted till 1993. Now in 1993 there was the Oslo Agreement. Now everyone thought that in 1993 under the Oslo Agreement that Israel and the Palestinians would find peace. And of course all these many years we've known that that is not the case. There's been intimate wars between 1993. Then the second Palestinian Infathada or the uprising, that started in September of 2000 and it ended in 2005. Now according to the news that I read today by and released by a general of Israel, the Infathada, the third Infathada or uprising against Israel was a different kind of uprising but that started 10 months ago, so it would have been January of 2014, and it has lasted, according to this article that I'm going to be showing you, November the 4th, which is today, 2014. Now, I know that there may be people in the audience today that really don't understand the importance of what's going on in the Middle East, and this is what I want to address. Now, if you go to my website, or if you watch any of my YouTube videos that I put up, you'll notice that I always give the word of the Lord first. And this, my friends, is the most important part. And I hope that you all here today agree with what I'm saying. The word of the Lord. Let's give a hand to Christ. I thank you for that applause for our Lord Jesus. But I'd like to examine what he tells us. In Zechariah 12.3, of course this is the King James Version, says, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. So right away we know that Jerusalem is going to be in the center of problems during the last days. Not just a few people, but when you look at the scripture, you'll see that it's going to be a burdensome stone for all people. Then it goes on to say, all that burden themselves will be cut in pieces. So in my website and in my book and here like my live presentations, I tell the people, look at whether you believe in Israel or not, if you don't back them, you're on the wrong side. You need to be on the side of the Lord God. He's protecting his people. That remnant of Israel will never be destroyed. And so it's very important to understand in the latter days, even the friends that Israel had at one time are going to fall away. It says, all that burden themselves will be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So what we know is Jerusalem is going to be the center of the news of the last days. We know that Jerusalem is going to be that major burdensome stone that all people are going to be burdened with it. And we also know that in the last days, everybody's going to turn against Israel, including the United States. And we're seeing that going into process now, more so than ever with the President Barack Hussein Obama. Now I put up on the screen there, you can see it says the third infanthada is already here. Let me read this. For 10 months now, the national uprising of the Palestinian people has been occurring. It is not similar to the predecessor and is, and is unusually kept on low heat, but it cannot be mistaken. It is part of Muhammad Abbas's strategy with the help of the Israeli right wing. The clashes in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria are inherently similar to the end of the first Infanthada. The Infathada of Stones, 
wholesale stone throwing and hurling Molotov cocktails, burning tires, clashes with police on the Temple Mount, and from time to time a terrorist attack involving firearms, a makeshift bomb, or a hit and run. The only novelty is the extensive use of fireworks by the rioting use, which they use against police officers in order to leave burns and more particularly instill fear. They are the Palestinian answer to the Israeli stun grenades. Whoever did realize it already, Police Commissioner Yohani and Danio, for example, this is definitely the third infantada. But unlike the nightmare scenarios we imagine, based on past experience, numerous Palestinians are not participating as they did in the first Infathada, or nor is it characterized by frequent and catastrophic terror attacks like the second Infathada. It has indeed been going on for at least 10 months since the breakdown of direct negotiations by Secretary of State John Kerry, but it has not yet been given the moniker of Infathada by the majority because it is usually carried out on a low heat. The events of the past summer, beginning with the kidnap and murder of three teenagers in Gush at Zion, leading to the revenge murder of the Arab teenager Mohammed Abdul Qadir in Jerusalem, and ending with Operation Protective Edge, certainly accelerated the events and fanned the flames, but the Infathada was there before. And although it began at the incentive of Abbas, as opposed to the previous infasadas, this time the extreme nationalist right-wing Israelis made sure to maintain it through provocation on their part. It helps Abbas and his people to disguise their role in inciting the Palestinian street and allows them to take advantage of the unrest for the maximum political and PR value. The popular uprising in Arabic, in Fathada, that we are witnessing now is an important ingredient in the Palestinian strategy after the breakdown of direct negotiations with Israel. Abbas is initiating it so that he can be used as a media background for the political campaign he is running in the international arena. Using this infathada light in Jerusalem and in their territories, the Palestinian leader is attempting to create headlines and a general media involvement that will motivate the international community to recognize a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders without having to compromise with Israel on any of their demands. Certainly not on the right of return, absolute control of the Temple Mount, or recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. I want to stop here for a second and just ask the audience today, how many people have come to my site over the past year and heard me talk about why the Palestinians and the Israeli peace process are going to break down? I've been giving you at least three of the different reasons, important reasons why the peace talks are going to fail. I've always pointed out Zechariah 12.3, when the, the problem with Jerusalem. But how many people have heard me talk about the borders of 1967 construction in Jerusalem and the problem with the Temple Mount. Raise your hand, would you please? Ah, oh, there's about 10, 15 people right here in this audience. So that, that shows me, by the way, thanks, for the, thanks to you people out there who are going to my website. That is a blessing for me. But I want to center in now on this particular paragraph in that article that was pulled out today, November the 4th, that I've been reading to you. Because this is really the heart of the matter, the heart of the contention problem within Israel and those Palestinian talks. As you see here, again, as we go over this, it talks about the Palestinian state within the 1967 border. Now, the 1967 borders, for those of you in the audience today who don't know, in 1967 there was a war between the Arabs and Israel. 
And that war, again, just like the previous wars, was won by the Israelis. And the 1967, the pre-1967 borders, was the Palestinians were controlling the Temple Mount. And for the first time in almost 2,000 years, because of the 1967 war, the Israelis who won that war won in and took hold of the Temple Mount area. And so, for the first time, it was back in their hands after I said almost 2,000 in years magnificent prophecy coming to pass there where the people the Jews going into the homeland in 1948 and 1967 gathering up their most holy site now the problem has been for those of you in the audience who may not know that in 1967 after the war the Israeli government allowed Jordan to take control of the Temple Mount in other words to run it even though the Israelis recaptured it and really own it today they to allow peace or to allow the the atmosphere at that time to calm down they placed it in the hands of the Arabs to run it now since that time since 1967 the people who have been running the Temple Mount have become more aggressive over the years to the point where the Jews can't even go up unless they're escorted by police officers or armed guards to go up there and pray. And that, my friends, is going to change because we know in the scriptures that the Lord showed us that the Third Temple was going to be rebuilt. And that is part of the problem that the Palestinians understand. They know the intentions of the Israelis. They know that the Israelis over the past years have been pushing forward and now are getting government officials in the Knesset to push forward for full access on the Temple Mount and to also to rebuild their temple, of which we know that it eventually is going to happen because it's in the Word of God already and we know that the Word of God always comes to pass. Now, in this particular article, it also talks about absolute control of the Temple Mount. And of course, last week, or this past week, Rabbi Glick, one of the main people pushing for the rebuilding of the Temple, the, the third Jewish Temple, and giving full access, was his life was attempted. Somebody tried to kill him. And so, we see, again, tensions building up over the borders, tension building up over the Temple Mount area. And again, the last paragraph, and you can see my cursor move on the screen there, it says recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Just go back. Anybody in this audience this morning, you want to go check Google and go to the Palestinian Charter because the Palestinian Charter has never changed. And I've said this a hundred times. The Charter itself says and calls for the destruction of the nation of Israel. And Abbas, the leader of the Fatah movement in the Gaza Strip, wants to destroy the nation of Israel. He does not want peace. They've had in the past, for example in 2005, they've had opportunities to have peace. And Abbas refused. And so we see the snowball effect of tensions building up in the Middle East, building up in Jerusalem and building up for sure in the Temple Mount area. And so don't look forward. If there's anyone in the audience today that think that there's going to be peace and Israel's going to give them full access, the Jews or the Palestinians full control completely so that it would ban the Jews off the Temple Mount, it's never going to go that way. It's going to go the opposite way because this is what Jesus Christ shows us in the last days. The Jews will have full access. They will be praying on the Temple Mount, and they will be praying in the third temple that's going to be rebuilt. Now, let me just say this. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I want to look out into the audience this morning and ask, please raise your hand if you think building the temple is going to be a good thing. Raise your hand. So as I look out today, Take a look around because you see the majority of the hands are lifted high. But let me tell you something, and I think that this may come as a shock to you all, that it is not a good thing. It's a double-edged sword. Let me explain. Number one, 
the Jews don't recognize Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. So that's a bad thing. And I think you would all agree in this audience this morning. Now, the Jews who do not recognize Jesus don't believe in any of the prophecies that Jesus gave. That's obvious. So, in not recognizing their Messiah, Jesus Christ, they are going to build another temple that the Antichrist is going to come in. In other words, if you read Daniel 9.27, you'll see that the man of sin is coming. He's going to confirm a covenant with Israel in many nations for a period of seven years. One week in prophecy. And one week equals seven years. So during that period of time where the Jews will think that this man is magnificent and he's giving them the, the temple area again to have full access and to pray and all these things, all it's going to do is set up a period exactly 1,260 days after the confirmation is confirmed that the Antichrist will go into this temple. Not Jesus Christ, the Antichrist, the man of sin. And now let me ask you a question again. For the Jews or anyone who misses the rapture of the church, do you think that that is good news? Raise your hand. <laughs> I figured that was going to happen. Nobody raises their hand. So you can see where the double-edged sword is. Yes, for the Jews who think that this is a good thing, it's not going to be a good thing. Now here's the good part of it. We know that when these things take place, and obviously the road is being set right now for it, that Jesus Christ will be returning shortly. How shortly? Well, again, if you read Daniel Daniel shows that when the man of sin goes into that temple, there would be 1,260 days later when Jesus Christ would come back with the church riding out of heaven on that white horse, coming back to earth, stepping on the Mount of Zion, and then going into Jerusalem. That, my friends, is the good news. And if you think so, give the Lord a hand. Now, because of time constraints this morning, I'm going to move away from that article. And, of course, we'll have that posted on my website later on today so you could read the rest of the article. But the main focus that I wanted you to see is war is coming, and it is coming in the form of what we see in scriptures. In other words, the road being paved over Jerusalem, that hot spot in Jerusalem, the destruction or at least the attempt of the destruction of the nation Israel as we see in Psalm 83. Now in relation to Psalm 83 where we see the Arabs coming against Israel in another war before the Ezekiel 38 war, let me show you a headline that came out also today. It said this, Nasserel to Israel, you should close your ports, our rockets can reach everywhere. Now, I, I taped this video for you. Nasserel is the leader of the Hezbollah, one of the other Islamic extremist groups bent on the destruction of the nation of Israel. And, of course, we know that Lebanon, that he's referring to, is mentioned in the Psalm 83. So listen to what he has to say, because it does show the paving to the road to the Psalm 83 war. So you see the countless number of Arabs, you see the countless numbers of the Islamic extremists calling for the destruction of the nation of Israel, including Nasserel, their leader, or one of their leaders. And so the road, my friends, is definitely being paved in the direction the Bible tells us it's to go. Now, it's everyone in this audience today, 
It's up to you whether to believe that we are in those last days and to be motivated to take the message out to the unbelievers or to sit where you are and do nothing for the Lord. But I hope that you do the latter. I'm praying that as you see that the Lord's words are coming to fruition, that you all come first of all to repentance for anything that you have done. And I do this myself. I'm not asking anybody to do anything other than I'm doing because I'm not perfect. I ask the Lord to forgive me on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, I even ask the Lord to forgive those things that I did that I'm not even aware that I did if they were sin. So I'm very God conscious because I love my Lord and I want to be with my Lord someday. I want to be a reflection of my Lord now before he takes me home. And I pray that all of you will be in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ as well when he returns. And so we need to pray as a corporate church, individuals coming together for this world for the nation of the United States and to ask the Lord to give peace to Jerusalem. And in closing, the only way that that could happen is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation and goes into Jerusalem to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. And that is what I'm waiting for. Because I know that when the Lord Jesus comes back riding on that horse, I will be coming with him. And I'm hoping you will too. God bless and thank you for allowing me to speak this morning.